Xbox and Shante. And right now, you are inside Van Dyke Hall with Dr. Darby. And don't forget, hip hop is a philosophy. A child is born with no state of mind. Blind to the face of mankind. Don't smile on me to be silent at you. Cause those are the God knows what you'll go through. You'll go with the devil in the second grade. It's a historic occasion to take some of these great artists, incorporate them into our curriculum, listen to their music, learn a little bit about their life, and most importantly, to have them in here with you to deliver knowledge. Hip hop made it cool to get knowledge. The whole inception of hip hop was really to be the voice of the disenfranchised. When Melly Mel came with the message, a child is born with no state of mind. Lying to the ways of mankind. When I heard that, when I heard those thoughts, it immediately spoke to me. It's a very quintessential part of the culture because the creation of hip hop was really for educational purposes. The knowledge is of the person, and that is the knowledge of coming from hip hop. You hearing directly from the horse's mouth, the effects of poverty, generational welfare, the effects of redlining, the effects of being cornered in certain impoverished neighborhoods. To me, the message, you know, virtually stayed the same. And that was not to glorify the street life, but to give you a vivid picture of the consequences of it. It's so vital that you guys broaden your perspective on what constitutes knowledge and where we can get knowledge from. Unas partes de Andalucía también son un ejemplo de rotacismo, aunque estos dos fenómenos conviven en Andalucía. Es mucho más común este, pero también puede haber este. ¿Vale? Y ahora me diréis, Iván, ¿qué es esto? Parece complicado, parece difícil, y yo sé que parece difícil, pero no es tan difícil. Vamos a empezar con el andacismo, ¿vale? Por ejemplo, vamos a poner nuestra mente en Puerto Rico. ¿Qué va a pasar en Puerto Rico? Una palabra como harto, yo estoy harto, estoy súper harto de, de algo, ¿vale? No estoy muy enfadado con algo. Esta R, esta R se va a transformar en una L, ¿vale? Otra vez, el andacismo es un proceso a través del cual la R pasa a ser una L. Por eso, si vais, escucháis a alguien caribeño, es posible que vayáis a escuchar en vez de decir harto, vais a escuchar decir alto. Estoy alto. El rotacismo es exactamente lo contrario y pasa, por ejemplo, en el sur de España. Tenemos una palabra como alma, no, mi, mi alma. Vamos a escuchar cosas como mi arma. La L va a pasar a ser R. ¿Vale? Entonces, son dos procesos fonológicos que básicamente la L se cambian se interactúan, ¿vale? ¿Lo habéis escuchado esto alguna vez? ¿Sí? Bien. En el uh, capital de, de República Dominicana ah. también tenemos uh, el racismo como yo digo um, amor y cuarto Ajá. y um, como cosas así. Muy bien, muy bien, pues ya sabes, ¿no? Ya sabes por qué. So let's say that you order a pizza for dinner one night, open up the box, take out three slices and toss them in the trash. Well, those three slices represent the amount of food that we throw away in this country each year. Now, imagine if you ordered pizza once per week for a whole year and did the same thing. Open the box, threw away three slices of each pizza that you ordered. At the end of the year, you will have thrown away 156 slices of pizza. So it really adds up over time. And with all the food that we produce in this country, 
30 to 40 percent ends up being 108 billion pounds of food. That's enough to fill the Empire State Building 1,000 times. Hi, my name is Taylor Ivey. I'm a recent graduate from Rutgers University in New Jersey. We're gonna to talk today about the long journey that food takes to get from a farm to your plate and beyond. Actually, you've already started having this conversation in class today. You've been talking about all the things that have to happen for an apple to get from a tree to this classroom. And what about apple pie? I bet you had some great ideas about how getting turned into a pie makes the apple's journey a lot more complicated and maybe more delicious. Last time we talked, we learned about the climate system. The climate system is all the different components like the land, the oceans, and the atmosphere that go into creating the climate. Today, we're gonna to talk about a different system, the food system. The climate system creates the climate and the food system creates the food. And just like the climate system, food systems have a lot of different parts or components. This video is presented by the Rutgers Global Tuberculosis Institute. The video explains how tuberculosis, or TB, is spread and what you can do to prevent it. Arun has just been diagnosed with TB disease. He has many questions, including, why did this happen to me? Did I make anyone else sick? How can I protect my friends and family? To answer these questions, let's first consider how TB germs spread. When a person has TB disease in their lungs or throat, they can release TB germs into the air when they cough, sneeze, sing, laugh, or speak. These germs are not visible with a naked eye and may remain floating in the air. If people breathe in those germs, they enter their lungs, which can become infected. This is most likely to happen if people spend a lot of time with someone who is sick with TB. Infection is less likely during short encounters, like when meeting someone while grocery shopping or mailing a letter. It's also less likely outdoors. Unlike the common cold, TB cannot spread by touching surfaces or other people, such as through handshakes, sharing utensils, or kissing. Once TB germs land on a surface, they cannot cause infection. Someone who has become infected may develop TB disease in their lungs or in other parts of their body, either soon after infection or years in the future. Most of the time, TB affects the lungs, but it can affect any part of the body. Disease in the lungs is called pulmonary TB. Disease in other parts of the body is called extrapulmonary TB. TB of the lungs is the type that is most likely to spread from person to person. <coughs> Someone with a strong cough and with lots of TB germs in their lungs is more likely to spread TB to others. Adults are more likely to spread TB than children. People are more likely to be infected if they spend a lot of time in close contact with someone who has TB disease, such as family members, co-workers, or friends. People who have lived in or traveled to countries with higher rates of TB are more at risk for becoming infected with TB. Since TB is spread through the air, anyone can become infected with TB. A diagnosis does not mean that a person did anything wrong. It only means that they breathed in TB germs and became infected. Without treatment, they can go on to develop TB disease, like Arun, and spread TB to others. It is possible for someone to spread TB before they know that they are sick or are diagnosed with TB. This is why it's important for Arun to speak with the health department and share information about who he has spent time with while he was sick, this includes family members, friends, and co-workers. The health department will reach out to anyone who might have been exposed to TB germs so that they can be tested and treated. This is called a contact investigation. If someone has been infected, they can be treated to prevent them from becoming sick with TB disease. The health department will not share Arun's name or tell that he has TB. They will work as hard as they can to keep Arun and everyone else's personal information private. Arun may be feeling guilty about spreading TB to others, 
but he can help keep his family and friends healthy by talking with the health department. He can also share what he has learned about TB and urge his family and friends to ask questions to help ease their fears. What are some ways that Arun can take action now to reduce the chances of spreading TB to others, including his friends and family? When Arun is first starting his treatment and before the medications have enough time to work, he may still be able to spread TB germs to others. This means that TB germs are still leaving his lungs when he coughs, sneezes, sings, laughs, or speaks. Until his body stops spreading TB germs, Arun should avoid spending time with others. If possible, he should sleep alone. These actions reduce the amount of time that others are exposed to the TB germs and makes it less likely they will become infected. Some patients who are very sick may need to be isolated in the hospital at the beginning of their treatment. When Arun does need to be near others, he should wear a mask. This reduces the amount of TB germs that enter the air and that can be breathed in by others. When he coughs or sneezes, he should cover his mouth with a disposable tissue. The tissue should not be reused. Fresh air from outside can also reduce the spread of TB by removing and scattering the TB germs. At home, this can include opening windows and doors for natural ventilation. TB is treatable and curable with the right medications. Arun's healthcare provider will discuss the best options for treating his TB. Most patients with TB will start feeling better early in their treatment and will be less likely to spread TB to others. A healthcare provider will perform tests to be sure. Even after he is no longer spreading TB, Arun needs to continue taking all of his medicine for the full length of his treatment. If he stops before his healthcare provider says it's okay, he may become sick and start spreading TB again. The health department can provide support to help Arun get through his treatment. Arun now feels more confident in his ability to protect others from being exposed to TB using isolation, masks, and ventilation. He will also follow his healthcare provider's advice to complete all of his treatment to help both himself and others. It can be scary to receive a diagnosis of TB, but it's important to know that TB is curable and that there are ways to avoid spreading it to others. Like Arun, you should be sure to share your questions and concerns so that your healthcare provider can help you with the information and care you need. For more information about TB, visit this website for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Este video es presentado por Rutgers Global Tuberculosis Institute. El video explica cómo se transmite la tuberculosis, TB, y qué se puede hacer para prevenirla. Arun acaba de ser diagnosticado con la enfermedad de TB. Tiene muchas preguntas que incluyen, ¿Por qué me ha sucedido esto? ¿He enfermado a alguien más? ¿Cómo puedo proteger a mis amigos y familiares? Para responder estas preguntas, primero consideremos cómo se transmiten los gérmenes de la TB. Cuando una persona tiene tuberculosis en los pulmones o en la garganta, puede liberar los gérmenes en el aire al toser, estornudar, cantar, reír o hablar. Estos gérmenes no pueden verse y pueden permanecer suspendidos en el aire. Si personas inhalan estos gérmenes, pueden ingresar a los pulmones e infectarlos. Es más probable que esto suceda si las personas pasan mucho tiempo con alguien que está enfermo de TB. Es menos probable contagiarse durante los encuentros cortos, como cuando se encuentra con alguien mientras está comprando o enviando una carta por correo. También es menos probable al aire libre. A diferencia del resfriado común, no se puede contagiar de la TB al tocar superficies u otras personas, por ejemplo, a través de un apretón de manos o al compartir utensilios. Una vez que los gérmenes de la TB lleguen a la superficie, no pueden causar un contagio. Alguien que ha sido infectado puede desarrollar la enfermedad de TB en sus pulmones o en otras partes de su cuerpo ya sea poco después de la infección o años después. Generalmente, la TB afecta los pulmones, 
pero puede afectar cualquier parte del cuerpo. TB en los pulmones se llama TB pulmonal. TB en otras partes del cuerpo se llama TB extrapulmonal. La TB pulmonal es la que tiene más posibilidades de contagiarse de persona a persona. <coughs> Alguien con tos fuerte y muchos gérmenes de TB en los pulmones tiene más posibilidades de transmitir la enfermedad a otras personas. Los adultos tienen más posibilidades de transmitir TB que los niños. Las personas tienen más probabilidades de infectarse si pasan mucho tiempo en contacto cercano con alguien que tiene la TB, como familiares, compañeros de trabajo o amigos. Las personas que han vivido o viajado a países con más casos de TB tienen un mayor riesgo de infección. Dado que la TB se transmite por el aire, cualquier persona puede infectarse. Un diagnóstico no significa que una persona haya hecho algo mal. Solo quiere decir que inhaló los gérmenes de TB y se infectó. Sin tratamiento, pueden desarrollar la enfermedad de TB, como Arun, y contagiar a otras personas. Es posible que alguien transmita la TB antes de saber que está enfermo o previo a recibir el diagnóstico. Por eso es importante que Arun hable con el Departamento de Salud y comparte información sobre con quién ha pasado tiempo mientras estuvo enfermo. Esto incluye familiares, amigos y compañeros de trabajo. El Departamento de Salud contactará a todas las personas que podrían haber estado expuestas a los gérmenes de la TB para realizarles pruebas y darles tratamiento. Esto se conoce como investigación de contactos. Si alguien ha sido infectado, puede recibir tratamiento para evitar que se enferme de TB. El Departamento de Salud no compartirá el nombre de Arun ni dirá que tiene TB. Hará todo lo necesario para mantener privada la información personal de Arun y de todas las personas. Es posible que Arun se sienta culpable por transmitir la TB a otras personas, pero puede ayudar a mantenerlos saludables hablando con el Departamento de Salud. También puede compartir lo que ha aprendido sobre la TB y alentar a su familia y amigos a que hagan preguntas para aliviar sus preocupaciones. ¿Cuáles son algunas de las formas en que Arun puede actuar ahora para reducir las posibilidades de transmitir la TB a otras personas, incluyendo sus amigos y familiares? Cuando Arun comienza su tratamiento por primera vez, y antes de que los medicamentos tengan tiempo suficiente para hacer efecto, es posible que aún pueda transmitir los gérmenes de la TB a otras personas. Esto significa que los gérmenes de la TB salen de sus pulmones cuando tose, estornuda, canta, ríe o habla. Hasta que su cuerpo deje de propagar los gérmenes de la TB, Arun debe evitar pasar tiempo con otras personas. Si es posible, debería dormir solo. Estas acciones reducen la cantidad de tiempo que otras personas están expuestas a los gérmenes de la TB, reduciendo la probabilidad de que sean infectados. Many of us enjoy white-tailed deer, whether it's through wildlife viewing or recreational hunting. What you may not realize is the deer impacting forests and the farmers that help us put food on our tables throughout New Jersey. here all my life. I'm 67 years old and grew up on a home farm, which I'm third generation. We're quite diverse. We uh, got a dairy farm. Uh, we milk about 70 cows and we farm about 1,200 acres of ground of corn, soybeans, wheat, oats, and hay, and they're all up throughout Franklin Township. Here, they'll travel quite a bit. They find a crop they want to eat and they'll travel every day, every night. We see more deer during the middle of the day. We just do see other times of the day. It's, they're changing their habits and they find something, a food source they like. They're, they're going to visit it as often as they can. By reducing the deer population as a whole in Somerset County, Franklin Township, we would have less motor vehicle accidents, less damage to our yards and gardens, as well as recovery of forests such as 
such as HMF and local forest properties. These programs can also be combined with venison donation that will actually benefit those in need in their local communities. We try to coordinate with local farmers at the food bank to uh, any excess crops that they have, might have. We donate ourselves. We grow sweet corn and donate to the food bank, the local food bank. I take a lot of the food bank vegetable waste from them that we spread out in the field as a fertilizer organic matter to save them money so they don't have to landfill it. We actually started monitoring deer in the area before the bow management program started. At that time, there was almost 150 deer per square mile. Now, to put that in perspective, that's about 15 times what we would want to see. We put two cameras side by side on the drone, a regular camera, mapping camera, and then a thermal camera, uh, infrared. and. We couldn't really see much with the regular camera, but the infrared worked really well, and we could see uh, a lot of deer munching on that corn. We've been able to see uh, the numbers coming down, and that's good. I think we started around 150 deer per square mile, and it's close to 60 deer per square mile now. And uh, so that's quite a drop, and that's due to good deer management, maybe some disease, but that number is still way too high, unfortunately. The numbers are still at least six times higher than what we want to see. People, we need help. Additional information you can scan with your phone that'll take you directly to the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station website. And you can always visit your local Rutgers Cooperative Extension County office. Welcome to Extension 360. We are glad you're here, and we hope you join us as we get to know the diverse programs of Rutgers Cooperative Extension and the interesting people that make them possible. We are your co-hosts, Kathleen Howell and Rachel Lyons. During each episode, we will interview Extension professionals. We will get to know their programs and learn how and why they do their jobs the way they do. Rutgers Cooperative Extension helps the diverse population of New Jersey adapt to a rapidly changing society and improve their lives and communities through an educational process that uses science-based knowledge. Extension 360 episodes will be about 25 minutes long, and two new episodes will be released each month. If you're new to podcasts, we encourage you to give this medium a try. The thing we like best about podcasts is they're completely portable. The episodes are a perfect companion as you drive to your next program or meeting, or take an episode with you on your next walk. We are launching this podcast with a few concurrent series. We will be starting off with Extension Excellence, where we will meet our 2020 Rutgers Cooperative Extension Excellence winners. 
Other series will include extension icons, where we will learn from longtime extension professionals who have left a lasting mark on our profession. And then recent arrivals. Here, we will get to know folks that have recently joined the Rutgers Cooperative Extension family and see where they are headed. If you know someone who would make a great Extension 360 guest, let us know. Fill out the guest nomination form on our show webpage, njaes.rutgers.edu slash extension 360. You can subscribe to Extension 360 wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Amina Khan, and I am Program Coordinator for the Office of Instructional Design within Rutgers Teaching and Learning with Technology. I make sure that faculty can focus on the learning experience without having to worry about the administrative side of things. Additionally, I curate the TLT blog, which is a great place to find interesting content for educators who are looking to broaden their conceptual understanding of online teaching strategy. Within TLT's Office of Instructional Design, I function as a central point of contact, keeping many of our operations running smoothly. This allows us to offer digital badges and online certificates, which are becoming central to professional development within the space of higher education. If you would like any more information, or if you would like to register for any of our online learning opportunities, please do contact me and I'd be happy to help. Hi, I'm Eric Leupold, and I'm an instructional technologist with Teaching and Learning with Technology. I can most help you as a faculty member by helping you to decide what are the right tools to use to integrate into your course and how to most effectively make use of them. In addition to teaching the introduction to Canvas and choosing the right tool for the job webinars, I also meet with faculty one-on-one -on -one to assist them with any special projects they have. A lot of faculty come to me who need help figuring out the technical aspects of Canvas and how best to optimize their online courses. Something you may not know is that there are currently over 60 third-party integrations that are available to be used in Canvas. I can help you to figure out which tool is the best to use and how best to utilize it. Hi, I'm Karen Harris. I'm a senior instructional designer with TLT. Many people don't really know what assessment is, so I often introduce it as a necessary function of lifelong learning. When I bring up the subject of assessment when I'm working with a faculty member, usually their frame of mind is how they are going to approach assessing student learning. And I like to help them change the focus so that they can begin to think of assessment as a way that they can also be more responsive and look more closely at their instructional effectiveness. As an assessment specialist, I am an asker of critical questions. I am an evaluator, a problem finder, an agent of change, and I advocate for students. My name is Mary Labrada, and I am the DEI and STEM Specialist at Teaching and Learning with Technology. As the DEI and STEM Specialist, I can help you by working with you to incorporate culturally responsive pedagogies and frameworks into your course or training. I can also help you with practices for critical self-reflection and talk to you about the dynamics of identity, power, and privilege that occurs in courses. I also advocate for equitable and inclusive learning experience for students and collaborate with DEIJ stakeholders across the university on faculty development initiatives. I also advise STEM faculty on content presentation and engagement strategies for their lab and lecture courses. One thing I like to tell faculty is to remember to keep students at the center of their course design. I ask them to think about what their students should be able to do by the end of the course instead of what it is that they want them to know. Also, regardless of the subject or course modality, students should always feel seen and included in their courses. Hi everyone, I'm Omar Samko and I'm an instructional technologist here at TLT. As an instructional technologist, I try to find ways to combine education and technology to help facilitate learning. For TLT, I run a lot of training webinars such as Intro to Canvas Part 1 and Part 2. So if you ever sign up for those, you might catch me in there. I can also help with a lot of the third-party tools that are in Canvas that Rutgers has to offer. I also try to make a lot of instructional videos that can help faculty and students with any of the tools that we have at Canvas. So if you need any help with video tools such as Kaltura or Playposit, you can reach out to me. 
I work with a lot of faculty who are new to Canvas, and a lot of times I see them overwhelmed and kind of scared to use it. One thing I can say is, take your time, play around in your sandbox, and the more time you spend in Canvas, the better you'll get at it. Welcome to our certification program entitled Autism Moving from a Deficit Model to Reaching Full Potential. Our program is destined to explore and change the perception of autism by offering the latest scientific and technological updates, bringing outdated practices currently in place to meet the new demands of the 21st century. Our first course is entitled Autism History and Research. It is a self-guided course and can be completed online through interactive e-learning. In this course, we will revisit methods for screening, diagnosis, and treatment of this broad spectrum of disorders under a new objective quantitative lens that includes neurodevelopmental aspects of sensory and motor issues infused by our latest advances in science technology, engineering, and mathematics. That is the STEM field. This course has three modules. Module one defines autism spectrum disorders according to traditional clinical means, while explaining the evolution of the diagnosis criteria shifting from uh, over the past several decades. And the last lecture of this module examines the, the timeline of autism physiology from birth until the screening for a neurodevelopmental derailment is possible. Hi, I'm Mary Beck Griffin, and I'm gonna be leading us through the course today. So just a quick overview of what we're gonna be doing in this class. So this is the Health Behavior Policy Research Design and Methods class 0600. So this is a basic course in research methods, and we're going to learn how to propose an analysis, plan an analysis, write an actual paper that is of peer-reviewed quality, and then how to publish that. So we're talking about all of the major parts of research design from selecting variables, selecting a data set, to selecting the right type of methodological approach, be it quantitative or qualitative methods. Um, so we're also going to do some stats, so numbers. I know numbers can be a bit frightening for people who are a bit math anxious, very much myself. Don't worry, we'll go through it really slowly. So it's going to be a bit of a refresher from your stats course, a bit of a refresher from your epi course, and then actually something new where we're learning how to use a statistical program. So in this video, we're going to be talking about different data assumptions, things that we have to assume based on our data set that will allow us to even begin our analysis. So first off, all statistical tests make common assumptions about the data that we're testing. The first one here is the independence of observations meaning that there is no correlation between the different data points that we see, meaning that my response to if I have insurance is completely independent of my um, data point about my gender or my sexual orientation or about whether or not I go to the doctor. We think that they're related, but they can't be related or the same exact thing, meaning the same exact thing in our data set. The other thing, the second thing that we assume about our data is the homogeneity of variance, meaning that the variance, the variation that we see in each group that we're comparing, so if we wanted to look at if people go to the doctor by their gender, their male or female, that the variance that we see within both of those groups is going to be similar. Because again, statistics relies on probabilities. It relies on the assumption that we're all more alike than we are different, right? So that all of the variance that we're seeing is the same across all groups. Okay, so in this video, we're gonna explore social cognitive theory. This is an interpersonal behavior change theory. So this particular theory emphasizes the dynamics that are underlying health behavior and the methods for how we can promote behavior change. 
This helps to explain why people behave in certain ways and why they may not behave in certain ways. The underlying element of social cognitive theory is this triadic, reciprocal, dynamic model in which the behavior, the person, and the environment interact. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in this video. And this is also a great model for providing a framework for designing what your program strategies will be and what you'll also target in your program. So social cognitive theory was actually called social learning theory when it was first developed by Bandura. He then changed it from learning to cognitive to really distance himself from the prevalent social learning theories of the day that focused more on learning. Bandura wanted to emphasize the role that cognition plays in people's ability to construct their own perception of reality and to encode information and perform behavior. So he felt that social cognitive theory was a more appropriate term. Today we're going to talk about naming conventions. We're talking naming Now, naming conventions are something that <clears throat> not everyone really either understands or likes. So why do we use a naming convention? You're probably not going to use a naming convention if you just have a JPEG file that you're moving to a folder on your computer. You're probably not going to have a, J a naming convention for that single one-off Microsoft Word document that you're putting on to, say, maybe email. But if you are going to be using a naming convention, you're probably going to apply that to a larger project, meaning something where multiple users are using the same document or need to reference clearly and quickly. They should be simple, short, and I'm going to put an er after that because this naming convention is not going to be that short. They should be concise. They should be quick and it should identify. All of these things make a good naming convention. So I'm directing these naming conventions for academic use, meaning faculty members are creating uh, large-scale projects, they're creating things that they absolutely need to have properly labeled. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna lead with our initials. So my initials are KRB. That means I am the author of this document. It means I'm taking ownership of it. Everyone knows that I've done that. The next step is I'm gonna add a date. Day, date, and time, you can put whatever you want. I'm just gonna put in today's date, which is going to be February 9th, 22. So now you're seeing I have KRB and today's date. So right off the bat, if you're looking for this file, you're going to find a file that's going to be identified to me as Kevin Burkett and you're also going to find the date that it was written on. Your next step is going to be your version number. Your version number is important because with the versioning, what happens is you're identifying which actual document you are working on. So you can say like V, v is for version 1.0, and then this number here would increase exponentially for each time you update the document. Wholesale changes, individual changes, changes of importance. The next idea is going to be, in academia, what your subject is. <clears throat> I used to teach digital media at another community college. So I would put in DGMD, and I'm also going to put the spring, the term as well. So I'm going to do DGMD 22, that way I know what the subject is and the year is. At this point, you can break it down to be both fall and spring, spring and fall, summer, winter, whatever you want. You can add another nomenclature here. You don't have to. In this case, DGMD 22 is going to get me within the ballpark Then I can search within that. Another section is going to be uh, which week you were dealing with the document. So, you know, as an instructor and I'm building my files, I want to be able to quickly identify things within my course structure that's going to give me an idea of which week. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to say this is going to be week four. And the last thing I'm going to do is give this a title. So I'm going to come back and say this is going to be um, needs analysis, N-D-S-A-L-Y-S. -S. And even that can be broken down a little bit farther. 
So why do we need something this big? What are we going to do with something this big? Well, if you're going to come in and you're going to go to your computer, you're going to pop up to the top right hand corner to the search bar and you're looking for a document quickly, you can come in and you can search all the documents that were that were created on February 9th, 2022, and this document will appear. You can come in and you can say all my 2022 digital media documents, that will appear. And you can say all my documents for week four will appear as well. So this big thing, this big shorter analysis that we're creating essentially gives you information that's searchable. So to recap and to kind of explain in one last time, name, date, version, subject, week, and some sort of descriptor that you can understand. As you go along, one might become two, two might become three, three might become four. I'm with Debbie Facenda and Joe James. They are product support people and specialists for a company called MicroStrategies, located in Parsippany, New Jersey. They've been in the technology support business to local governments for over 40 years. Guys, tell us a little bit about what you, services you provide from a, te a technology standpoint to local governments. You want to talk? Sure. Um, hi, MicroStrategies, um, as we said, is an IT solutions company. We offer uh, data analytics that help higher education um, institutions track student successes. We also handle um, voice recording for fire, EMS, and police. We do manage services and we run them 24-7, 365 out of our Parsippany location. What, what does managed services mean in this case? Uh, what, what, are the, what are the services that, that you provide municipalities? Manage, manage, this is Joe James from MicroStrategies also. Uh, managed services is that we provide are the services that we take care of your complete network. All you do is install your computers, we take care of everything else. Any problems that you have, you call us 24 seven. see you there. I was too busy working from home, like many other Rutgers faculty and staff. Well, as long as you're here, why don't I show you some of the ways that you can collaborate remotely with the new Media Center. You can send us content and we'll edit it for you, right from the comfort of your own home. Come on, let's take a look. So, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to focus on how to upload content so that it becomes accessible to the new Media Center team. We're going to start off doing this at ruckers.mediaspace.caltera.com. And the first thing you're going to need to do, if you haven't done it previously, is log in. So you're going to go to the top right hand corner, you're going to click on the guest icon, and click log in on the drop down menu. Once you've entered your login information, you'll arrive at the main page for uh, Caltera Media Space, and you're going to click on the add new button, once again in the top right hand corner. This will take you to this upload media screen. For the purposes of this demo, I'm just going to upload a video I've been working on recently. Once you select a video to upload, it'll take you to this screen where you'll see a progress bar. You'll see the option to fill out specific details about the video. You can give the video a name. You can enter in a brief description for your video. and. Uh, but what's most important is you'll see an option to add a tag to the video. The tag that we're using for uh, any video that's being uploaded while we must work from home is WFHNMC, and that stands for Work From Home New Media Center. Using this tag makes it so that the New Media Center team can locate and work on whatever video you are sending to us via Caltera Media Space. Welcome to Academic Matters. I am Dr. Laura Leong, and I'm excited to be featuring the goings-ons of the teaching and research at the Rutgers School of Public Health. I also get to talk about important issues that concern our students, and we'll also hear from people that who work 
teach and do research at the school. And today's guest is Dr. Shauna Downs, Associate Professor in our Department of Health Behavior, Society, and Policy. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Will you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Public Health. I do food systems research, so my work is really focused on how you can make it easier for people to eat well in the context of their lived experiences. And I do a lot of my work in low middle income countries. So I spend a lot of time in South Asia and also in Sub-Saharan Africa doing research. And how did you get started on focusing on that, the low income area? Yeah, so I actually started off in my master's research. I worked on an Aboriginal community or in an Aboriginal community in Canada. And when I was doing my research, so I spent time in the community and basically there's really poor access to food in that community. So there's a, it was a very small community. It was like remote. And um, in, in that community, there was, you know, a few restaurants. They were mostly selling like fried chicken and poor quality foods. There's only one grocery store and it sold really poor quality fruits and vegetables. Like they literally were kind of rotting on the shelves. They, you know, truck in buckets of KFC from Montreal and sell them in the grocery store. And there's really high levels of overweight and obesity, particularly in kids in that population. And it got me starting to think about how our food system really drives our food choices and how, you know, constrained our decision making can be around food when the environment that we live in doesn't support us to eat well. That's yeah. excellent. That's great. Well, thank you for joining today. Thanks for having me. And thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next time on Academic Matters.